Hello everyone, welcome back once again, it's Draskal here. We're going to be bringing you another replay analysis today of myself. This is going to be playing a four position pudge. Now as just a, a disclaimer before we get into the video. I'm not really going to talk a ton about pudge himself, so this is not really meant to be a pudge specific guide. But what I really want to talk about during this video and the replay analysis is when I'm dying, do I think it's okay? I want to talk about the difference between a good death and a bad death, specifically from the position four or maybe even five roll. So that means we're probably going to be dying a lot this game and we're going to be sacrificing ourselves to enable other heroes. Now, the way that I play supports is I always try, if I believe in the, the core player, to enable them as much as possible. So like I'll, I'll buy wards for them if I'm playing five, this game I'm not obviously, and I'll die for them if I feel like it's valuable. So in this game, we're going to talk about the early laning phase, how I play it, how I pressure, you know, when I'm choosing to sacrifice myself for my core hero, how I'm taking fights, stuff like that. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to fast forward a little bit so we can get to the actual laning phase. But I see a lot of people ask the same questions. They'll be like, I don't know if it's okay that I've died like 15 times in one game. And this game I had, I believe I had double digit deaths. And obviously Pudge is a hero that, you know, he gets he gets a lot of value from living through the fights because you get your flesh heap stack. But if you look at my team composition, I have a tree, myself, two ranged heroes, like both my cores stay pretty far in the back. And then there's also a brewmaster. So when this brewmaster splits and my tree is invis, I'm basically the only person who's going to be a viable target for the enemy team to attack. Now this is assuming like the storm doesn't ball in, like behind me and go for my sniper and my Zeus and the, the Ember doesn't ram that in and stuff. But most of the time I'm going to be putting myself in harm's way. As a position four, some games you're going to have to die. You just got to deal with it. You got to be like, all right, is my death worth something? So we threw a hook out there, didn't get the bonnie room, but we got some damage on the Doom, which is fine. Now, I don't have mana, uh, mana regen here. I didn't buy a mango. I wanted to focus on having a lot of just raw health regeneration so that I could take potential trades and, and try to bully uh, the enemy team out of the lane. So we're going to go a little bit quick through the laning phase because a lot of the stuff that happens up here is just, you know, we're trying to secure the farm for the sniper. That's basically the whole, the whole goal of the lane before anything really happens. We're just trying to make sure that this guy can hit creeps. Now, unfortunately, this lane is not really that good for me. If we just look at it from a an objective point of view, like we're against Doom. This guy has almost 800 health, very hard to go on this guy. And then they have Lena, who has, you know, 560 HP, an absolute boatload of regeneration, and also very, very long range attack, right? So this lane is not somewhere where I feel like I'm going to be able to contribute a ton, but just my presence here means that the Doom and the Lena are not going to be able to freely walk into my sniper. Now, making this distinction in the game is going to take some practice. You know, knowing whether or not you're actually doing anything for the person that you're laning with, that's going to take time. But I think even the, the MMR players, like around 1 to 3K, are going to have some sort of feeling of, I don't think I'm doing anything here. So if you don't feel like you're contributing in a lane, then just leave. Do something else, right? Like try to get bounty runes if it's 5 minutes, 10 minutes. Try to maybe pressure another lane. Try to snipe the courier. There's a lot of stuff you can do if you feel like you can't contribute in the lane. But in this game, just me kind of existing here is going to make it so that the sniper is having a lot easier of a time hitting creeps. Because I'm essentially his shield. I'm going to sit in, like, sit in front and, and just be like, okay... I'm, I'm the one who wants to really go in here. So I hit level 2. We go for a commitment there. I land a hook. And that's going to be one of our kills. We go for the, the loop around here on the Doom. Just going to break his salve to make sure that he doesn't get the full extent of it. And then we're going to go ahead and back off. So our first commitment was a success. And that's good for us. I'm also going to drop a lane ward just in case. You know, someone TPs. I want Vision to throw my hooks. Now, you can drop wards like that, even if you're not Pudge. If you want to just have vision of the lane, and more importantly, see when people are teleporting in, dropping a ward over here is uh, is very, very good for that. It is a common ward spot, though, so at higher MMRs, if you place it in an obvious manner, it's probably going to get dewarded. So just as a note, like I placed it that way specifically because I was in fog, and the chances of them seeing me place that are very low. 
So once again, we get into a little altercation here. I hooked Alina, and unfortunately, Pudge is very slow. Like, I don't have boots. So because I don't have boots, I overcommit. You know, I end up dying. Obviously, this was bad, right? Like, I hooked Alina. I tried to communicate with my sniper player that I hooked Alina and that I wanted him to turn around and hit, but he didn't, right? So because he didn't turn around, we didn't end up getting the one kill, and then... I end up dying because the, the Lena lives through that initiation. So we land another hook. We get a kill on the Lena. Now, important to note that even if I do die here, like this Doom is, is very, very low HP. He's gonna walk it off. Gets hit by the tower once and he takes a bad path away. Like maybe he could have lived, maybe not. But what I wanna talk about is the fact that my sniper lived through both of those kills. He's gonna get the shrine so he doesn't have to back to base even though he kind of shrined when our mid player needed it, but that's less important. The fact is, I died, but both of the heroes that I, I was laning against died too. So my sniper gets EXP, my sniper gets gold, my respawn timer is not that long because I'm only level 3, and because of that altercation, we end up securing a top bounty room. So if we're weighing the value of my death, I'm thinking to myself, that death is super, super good for us. So I hooked Alina again, still no boots. Getting a lot of damage on him, though, helps because he's not going to be able to freely walk up to the creep wave anymore, right? So my sniper has to go back to base. It's a little bit unfortunate. Actually, he might have... No, he didn't die. Okay. I was just making sure he didn't. He just went back to base because he got harassed. The Lena comes out again, and I have an empty lane, which is kind of neat. Sometimes this will happen. Your core hero will have to go back to base, and then you'll have an empty lane to get some EXP. On a hero like Pudge, who is very level dependent, it's great. To have that little bit of, a, of an influx of EXP because the closer you get to six, you know, it's about seven minutes in, I'm almost level five. This is really good. Like, this is really good, like, levels and EXP because I got like a wave and a half or two waves by myself. So that means the, the sooner I get my ult, the, the more I can do in the game. Now, there are some fours that aren't going to be like as reliant on that level six. Like, Pudge is probably one of the heroes that gets the most kill potential. If my tree was a, a 4, for example, instead of me, his level 6, while good, doesn't necessarily allow him to solo kill because his ult doesn't deal damage. So even though it's a disable, you know, it, it doesn't really give you the, the chance to kill that easily. So, we're kind of soaking still. We're sitting in fog. We want them to be scared of us. This is like a Pudge-specific thing. Whenever you're in a, in a lane like this, say you're safe lane dire or safe lane radiant, sitting in a tree line can be mentally taxing on the opponent because they don't know where you are and if you've ever played against the pudge you know the feeling of oh man i don't know where the pudge is i feel like i'm just going to get hooked so that's why i'm sitting here i'm also not really too concerned for my sniper player because he has boots and it's very difficult for the enemy offlane to walk into him and just kill him without me doing anything right like even though i'm sitting here i should still be able to to get to him to do something if they decide to commit so All right, so we land a hook on the Doom. This guy is really tanky, and I have to commit pretty hard to get the kill on him. I got some stick charges as well. We're going for a little bit of a bait play here. The Lena's going to juke into the trees. I don't know exactly where that guy went, but I do see that he casted a, a Dragon Slave. Unfortunate that I missed the hook. And now we're just going to buy some more regen, and that way... Uh, we don't have to go back to base. You notice that I'm using the courier quite a bit. Uh, if your mid player or your, your core player needs the courier, I probably would have gone back to base. But my entire team is fighting bottom. So I'm just going to always buy items to make sure that I'm at a high threshold of HP so that I can contribute. So this time again, they run past the tower. They have a double wave. I'm sitting in fog. So they, I go for the weak target, right? If I hook the doom, this guy is really, really hard to kill. He's got 1300 health. I hooked Alina because she's got half the health. So now that I have my boots, this guy is going to go down pretty easily. I hit 6 off the Lena kill. And unfortunately, my, my lane ward went down, and we don't have another ward top, so I didn't know that the storm was missing. But again, we trade 1 for 1. And an important thing that we, uh, that we should know when we're talking about Pudge is that Flesh Heap is retroactive. And what that means is every time I get a kill and I would have been credited for a Flesh Heap stack, as soon as I skill the ability one time, 
I get all the stacks that I would have gotten otherwise. So every time I get a kill and I trade one for one, you know, the core hero and the mid teleported up to me to try to get a kill. I smoke up here to make sure that uh, I can secure the bounty runes. This is also something they can do when you fudge. I land a hook on that guy. Zeus ults to help me get the kill. And we get the other bounty. Now, as a four, if you're having an early game like I am, and you're like this pudge, and you're almost level seven to ten minutes, you're feeling really good about it. If you can get to the high ground like that, always go for the enemy bounty first. Because the enemy bounty is obviously easier for them to get to, but harder for you. So if you're already in position, then taking the bounty from them first and then walking to your side of the map is more efficient than going for yours and then theirs, because the likelihood that they would have taken their own by the time you're able to walk up there is very high. And plus, they could already be in position when I walk up that hill regardless, but that's why I popped the smoke. So I popped the smoke as sort of like a, a pseudo scan. Some high level players will scan the high ground before they walk up just to make sure no one's there. I popped the smoke so that if my smoke reveals, then I know there's a hero there. So I know that I have to either back off or, you know, maybe I throw a blind hook and try to get a kill. But that's a nice little trick you can use as a four is if you, especially like, I would say below 6k MMR, no one buys smokes. Just no one buys them. And if they buy them, they use them poorly. So just buy a smoke. If you're trying to go for a high ground on a bounty rune, just use it. And then if it pops, you know there's heroes there. So we go back for the solo shrine. A bit greedy on my part. But I feel like at this point we're doing fairly well. We get the ward and the D ward down in the top lane. Doom's gonna go for the hook dodge. Now again, I go in immediately. I just want to rewind this because the, the premise of this video and, and what I really wanted to talk about is kind of how you play a sacrificial role. So they're running at my sniper, right? Like I know these guys are committed 100%. Like they're gonna go on my sniper, they wanna kill him. I'm the four, this guy's position one. My life is less valuable than this guy's life. I want my sniper to live. So the first thing I do is I walk in, I make sure I got Rod on both heroes. There's a shrapnel here too. So the Doom can't really get in range to cast Doom on the sniper. And if he does, I'm biting the Lena. And by biting the Lena, it's ensuring that there's no damage follow-up after the Doom is cast. So I go in, I force the Doom to target me with all of his spells, as well as the Lena, right? Now, the unfortunate part is I die before the Lena. So that kind of stinks, right? Like, I would have really liked to get the Flesh Heap stack for it, and I'm not going to get it. But I sack myself, and my sniper ends up living, right? So we go one for one. Now, this is an unforeseen consequence. Like, the Storm TPs, right? That's what this hero does. He can TP from anywhere and just ball straight in and kill the sniper. So even though I made the correct play, the sniper still dies, but that's fine. From our particular play perspective, we did the, the we did the right thing. We wanted to save our core. Alright, so we're gonna respawn here. Gonna TV back to the lane. We're level seven now. We get a nice couple of uh, CS there, able to finish our tranquil boots. Now we're not like crazy farmed or anything, but we're still dangerous. That's the nice thing about playing Pudge and Pubs is that even if you don't have like a hood or a blank dagger or blade mail or anything like that, just landing a hook can be all the difference in the world. So I scan, looking for heroes, don't see anything. I'm looking bottom. I just want to make sure that I know what's going on. I want to know who's going to be capable of TPing. As soon as I make the judgment call that they're not going to be able to really react to this, I go and I cut the waves so that the tower dies faster. So now we're looking pretty good. We're gonna TP to defend our own tower. As soon as this tower dies, the top, uh, sorry, the off lane tier one, that's now the time where I feel like I'm good to leave the lane. In some games, you're not gonna be able to stay as static as I was in this game. Now it's 13 minutes. This is the first time I've left my sniper. And the reason that is because he can't, he can't sit in the lane alone, right? Like against Doom Lena, there's no way I can abandon him. If I abandon him, he's not going to have a game. So you also need to make that choice when you're playing. If I leave, does this hero just get completely shut down? Now, a Doom and a Lena are just going to run at him under tower. That Doom went phase boots. I think he also ended up going drums. Yeah, so this guy runs very quickly. He's got an ensnare creep. 
and with the Scorched Earth buff, he can tower dive my sniper easily. Like, just, there's nothing the sniper is going to be able to do about that. So I needed to be there in order to prevent that guy from dying. And again, you're going to have to make your own judgment call when you're in-game to know if that guy is going to need your help or not. So we get a hook. We get the Static Storm forced on us. But I want to I wanna talk about something here, too, is the enemy team is kind of between our towers right now. So this is a very dangerous spot for them to be. Now, I hook the Doom. The Disruptor Static Storm's me, right? Like, I am eating the majority of the spells. So that, in my eyes, is good. Because we've already traded one for one. And the Doom is kind of stuck behind the tower. So because of that, we end up getting three kills. So I hook that guy into a really bad position. And his team makes a choice to commit to the fight. Obviously, that was a bad idea. Because the positioning of the fight was very, very bad for them. So even though I die, it results in my team getting three kills. So again, valuing my death, that time instead of a one for one like it was top, it was a three for one. So again, I would say that death is fine. So we've got our flesh heap stacks now. We're running down here. We're trying to we're trying to commit to this fight. Our trees here are ready with the brewmaster. We're gonna get one kill, two kills, and three. We get an easy dismember and two flesh heap stacks. Now this fight was kind of gifted to us. I would say you're not really going to get too many fights like that where the enemy team is just kind of haphazardly running in. But that was very fortuitous because I didn't die and it allowed me to get some stacks. So I got a couple of people going back to base. I see an empty lane. I'm going to take it for the time being. And again, as a reminder, I'm a four. Okay, So I'm not really buying a lot of wards this game. If you see an empty lane and nothing is happening on the map, and you feel like you have adequate vision as a four, it's okay to, to take an empty lane. I see a lot of people who just go, oh, someone else should be there besides me. While that may be true, if no one's there, and you don't have to like TP to be there, which is a big no-no, never ever TP to an empty lane as like a four, if nothing's happening on the map, because you don't know when something's gonna break out, right? Like you can theorize, but you don't know for sure Especially with like a Storm and an Ember on the other team. Those heroes can just go in at the drop of a hat. So I walk to my empty lane. I do not TP. If you're playing a core, it's a bit different. But for a 4 and a 5, TPing to an empty lane, you have to be 100% certain that nothing's going to happen. So we're hitting some, hitting some buildings. The Storm goes on me, but he doesn't want to commit. A little bit too tanky. So our sniper dies, I TP a little bit late, it's unfortunate. But again, I'm kind of doing that thing where I sit in fog, waiting to see if a hero goes. I notice that the storm has uh, walked to the mid lane. So the, the movement that I did here was incorrect, like, I TP, and I'm soaking an empty lane, and I was assuming that someone was still going to be here, and I end up leaving it for my sniper to farm. But now that I'm up here, he feels more safe, right? But yeah, likely I should not have TP'd in the manner that I did. I would have been better off just staying mid because that way I would have pre prevented my Zeus from dying. I knew the Storm was there too. That's that's the part that makes it a bad TP. Is that like I, I knew the Storm was there. And I knew my Zeus was there. But I TP'd away anyway. Good positioning from the tree player here. And Overgrowth sets up in a two kills. That was just really nice. I got uh, nine flesh, flesh heat now. We're working our way towards... I think I go Hood first. Hood is crazy value this game. Everything they do basically is magic damage. We see a fight going on bottom. We're still just kind of hitting the tier 2 tower with the sniper. Just doing a bit of slow sieging here. It's a bit of an awkward position for a Pudge because there's not really a whole lot of places that I can hide here. So after a while, I say, okay, committing to this no longer makes sense. We don't have overgrowth. We don't have the heroes necessary here to fight, and we don't have split. So because our ultimates were down, I just make the call that I don't want to be there. Now, I TP to the empty lane because I assumed that nothing was going to happen for quite a while. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, here I die. And thinking about it, if this death results in a tower going down, then it's a bad death. Because I'm in front of an objective, I get picked, and then the tower dies, which means that the enemy team gets something more valuable than just a 4 kill. 
if I die and the tower lives, then essentially to me, you know, I don't feel like that's too bad. My sniper and my, my brewmaster are both bottom, which is unfortunate. You don't really want two cores to share the same lane. But if we watch, we'll see what happens. So the enemy team ends up, I assume, getting this. So our tree is trying to get in position. He gets doomed before he casts a... Uh, or no, he did overgrowth. Never mind. He hated overgrowth. So I die. The enemy team commits heavily for that. And they do not get the tier 1. So that's very lucky for us. Our sniper is very, very out of position here and ends up getting picked off. I was making my way down there to actually stand behind him. But I couldn't make it in time. So I'm going to throw a hook at their bounty rune to make sure I can get it. Something very Pudge specific. No other heroes can really do that. It's like one of the few heroes that doesn't have to uh, walk to the, the other rune first. Notice that they have a sentry there because the creeps are walking at me. So there's a panda split up here. And this guy is going to die for sure. And I see a couple of heroes. I see the Disruptor and I see the Ember. Uh, the Ember is the high priority target because he's the core. Obviously, the Disruptor has some spells that he can cast on me. I think his Storm is already down, yeah, but he does have Glimpse. So we go in. I get fogged here pretty hard, so I'm going to be forced to throw a hook out on the Disruptor instead. Dismember does have a bit of a, a cast animation, so sometimes you will get fogged. It's just unfortunate, but that's how it goes. I was looking for the hook there when he balled in. But you can see, like, right now... If we just assess the state of the game, it's 21 minutes in. If we look at the scoreboard, I'm 5, 6, and 9. So not like a, it's not a super impressive score, but I have more EXP than basically everyone on the enemy team, except for the Storm. And I have a Hood. I got my stick. I got Tranks. I mean, I'm not rich by any means, but I have enough to feel like I can contribute. You know, I got 2k health, 3 armor. We got our 10 Flesh Heap stacks, so I get 15 bonus strength from that. That's 300 health. Like, at this stage in the game, even though I've died six times, I still feel like, you know, I've done a fair share, right? Like, I'm not crushing this game, but the ways that I've died, most of them I've been okay with. So we're going to walk down the midline. The mid-tier one is still up. So this is definitely something that we should prioritize getting off the map. The mid-tier ones are, are very, very important for both teams. These towers provide very, very good, uh, very good TP reaction. So, I want to rewind and show you guys what just happened here. So, I see the Lena, right? Like, right here, I, I don't think... Was this far enough away? I think we have to go back farther. Okay. So, we're going to play this. Now, I saw a hero in Fog on the minimap. You saw for like a split second, I saw the Disruptor, right? So I'm going to walk up and I'm going to throw the hook thinking that I'm going to hit the Disruptor. This ends up being extremely bad. So the Doom is standing like in this little patch of trees right here. Because I was throwing a hook to try to hit someone else. So because I hit this guy, I'm like, oh god, well I have to dismember him now, right? Because I just hooked him into my team. So the problem with this is like my tree doesn't have ult. It's like five seconds away from being available. And I hooked the tankiest hero into our team. Now, it was an accident. I didn't mean to hook the Doom. But this is, like, the worst case scenario. So this is just a really, really bad death. Because not only do we not get anything, but we lose pretty much every single hero. It was unfortunate. If I had hit anyone else, that fight would have been a lot different. Because the person that I hook, being the tanky hero, means that he actually doesn't die. And I also end up buying back here because I thought they were going to continue to chase, but they didn't, so. We go for a cancel on the hook, doesn't work. And I think I actually just end up dying again. Yeah, I think I die again here. So obviously the, the two deaths here were really bad. Like, there was no... Um, there was no benefit, really, from me buying back. I just bought back originally to try to save my Zeus. And then, because I bought back and there were heroes at low HP, I got greedy. I tried to go for a kill that was low probability when the entire enemy team was still alive. And I get punished because they outnumber me. So when you have 
a situation like that, like buying back, I, I was like, okay, whatever. It was kind of a bad buyback because I didn't actually like need to. Maybe my Zeus was fine. But then I commit for a fight and then it feels awful because I just die two times in a row. So now we're feeling pretty bad about it. Not the best. But it's important to recognize that when you do stuff like that, that you own up to it. That you say, oh god, this was actually just really, really bad. Like, that was probably the worst thing that could have happened, is what I did there. So we're walking down the midline again. We're going for the push. This time we have the split, so we're feeling a bit more confident. And our tree is uh, in the jungle, so we can kind of see what's happening. He gets doomed. And I try to go for a hook. Like, I was trying to hook the Ember, actually. Because I knew that as soon as he got doomed and rooted like that, that he was going to die. So I didn't want to hook him. And there are a lot of heroes on me right now. Lots of stuns. And we kind of get team wiped. So again, bad fight. Just, we get the tower. My tree doesn't get his ult off. Panda split ends. So us lingering there was not ideal. Like, as soon as we got the tower, we should have backed. I went for a greedy hook. Even if I hit the Ember, I can't be sure that that would have resulted in a kill. And the enemy team just kind of rolls over us because our, our main control in the team fight is Bruce Split and Overgrowth. So when one of those things is not up, it's very hard for us to take a fight. So we see the Lina. We go for the hook on the Storm. He has BKB, so I just bite him during it. Get to force him to use all his mana and run. We get the hook on the Doom. We get another Flesh Heap stack. Nice kill. And that fight was alright. We get the Storm, we make him pop BKB, we go 3 for 0, that one feels pretty good. I'm gonna run to my Sniper player because I don't want him to get uh, to get killed. We see the Lena in Fog here, we get another really easy quick pick. And the Ember Spirit tries to go for my Sniper but he misses his Remnant to the high ground so he ends up dying as well. So in the last minute or two we had a nice turnaround. We get like... 4 0 and 5 0 twice in a row. But then the enemy team like breaks up and starts split farming on the map. That's something that you're going to see a lot in every single bracket. Is that as soon as a team fight breaks down, people are going to go back to just like their efficiency stuff. So the storm kind of just lets me walk into him. That was a huge mistake on his part. I don't know why he thought that uh, he could just let me walk up like that. I think he maybe got mini stunned by the Nimbus and thought that he would have time to ball away when in reality he didn't. So my next item here is going to be Blink. And Blink just allows me to get on the hero that I want quicker. That's the main uh, the main goal. And it also forces the enemy team to attack me. See, like right there, I get the Blink and the Dismember onto the Ember Spirit. I eat a Glimpse and a Doom at the same time. So while I get Doom with Rod on, I have the Hood. There's a regen in the bot lane, so I'm going to be able to recover basically all of that. And then the storm goes back in, so I just blink fight him to save my panda. Get a lucky hook there onto the disruptor, he goes down as well. And even though I had to break my, my regen for that, I'm going to say it's worth. So now, like, I'm level 19, it's 30 minutes in, I've been involved in a lot of the kills. And yeah, we had some bad deaths. I'll be honest, like, there were some deaths this game where I look at it and I'm just, like, shaking my head going, why on God's green earth did I do that? Like, there is no way that I should have bought back and then walked in like I did, right? That's that's one thing that you look at when you're, you know, at... You're going over your own replays and you're like... It actually hurts you to watch. Because you know better, but in the moment, sometimes stuff goes wrong. The important thing is, you don't tilt because of it. And you just try to keep playing the game that you're supposed to play. Because what really matters in every single pub is consistency. If you consistently play it to like 90 to 95 percent of your ability, you'll find that your win rate's still gonna go up, right? So I line a couple of nice hooks here, sets our team up for success. The enemy team has no buybacks. I get a nice blink fight on the storm. Or sorry, that was the uh, Ember, excuse me. He got the Searing Chains off and was able to just rem them away. So because of those few kills, uh, it secures us racks. 
And we're feeling fairly confident. We got a AK lead. It's not too bad. And at this point, like, I'm pretty pretty tanky. I would like an armor item at some point. Just because when you have such a high amount of health, like 3,300 health and 5 armor, the best way to boost your effective HP as my hero in a situation is to get armor. Because my health pool is so large, and I already have a hood, plus Flesh Heap gives me magic damage reduction anyway. So the best way to increase my, my effective HP is just, like, even a plate mail would give me a ridiculous boost in my survivability in fights. And, and part of the thing that my hero does is absorb damage. Like, their entire team was there, right? It took them, like, 10 seconds to kill me. And that's without an armor item. Now, unfortunately, I was following my sniper around because I didn't want him to get killed. And I tried to hook him out, but it didn't work, right? So that death you could consider to be... I'd say that's, like, a borderline bad death. Obviously, me being there with a the sniper is fine. But throwing the hook pretty much killed me, where I might have been able to just get away otherwise, but I wanted to save him, so I threw it anyway. The nice part about that death is that the enemy team is not really going to be able to do a whole heck of a lot here. Like, they're walking into our jungle and stuff, but as far as objective taking, I'm not really too scared about them killing Roshan, and we don't really have any towers to take in the mid or the top lane. So even though, yeah, we both die, it sucks to die, at the end of the day, what matters is the objectives that get taken while you're dead. So they're Rack's bottom, right? Which means the bottom lane is going to be pushing in that entire time. They're fighting us by their top shrine, which is on the opposite side of the map of where that lane's being pushed. Plus, again, team can't really hit Roche. Now I TP up here to try to save my Zeus. I was a little bit late. Get a flesh heap stack anyway. End up getting a kill on the Ember, so it's a one for one. At this point, I'm still trying to think about what I wanted to buy. I eventually decide on the Assault Cuirass. Again, large amounts of effective HP, that's what we're looking for. It gives, it's pretty much the highest armor item, I think, for the slot. You could also go something like Shiva's if you really want to. It's nice synergy with the blink, gives you a bigger mana pool. We're gonna go for Roche with the Ember being dead. Also with bottom and top lane being pushed in. It's a relatively safe call. And now we're just waiting for everyone to group up. We're going to take the top shrine. And I am very, very close to my AC here, so... We take a couple of neutral creeps. We're going to send the courier out, so we're going to have that uh, that AC for the push. We even have a Vlad's, too. So we have Vlad's and Assault, which is a lot of bonus armor. It's a lifesteal for, uh, for our heroes as well. And now I'm just a monster, right? Like, I go from having, like, 6 or 8 armor to, with all my auras, I have 27 armor. The enemy team goes for a little bit of a commitment here. I'm trying to wait out for a hook. Disruptor's gonna go down and immediately buy back, as well as our Brewmaster. But see, I walk up to the high ground, right? Because I'm the tanky hero. I want them to cast spells on me, more or less. Like, I want them to go on me because if they're hitting me, then my sniper can actually do so. I try to go for a hook on my sniper player. My panic commits, so I want to go in as well. I get glimpsed out again. And the enemy team is, you know, a lot of buybacks are being expended here. So the Disruptor bought back, the Storm bought back, and they lose the Ember. So basically, we team wiped them right there. We team wiped them in their own base, and they bought back. Plus, we took Roshan. So people would be in this game right now, maybe like you know, 3k, 4k players, and they would be upset at that fight. They would go, man, that fight sucked, because we just got wiped, right? We had ages, why didn't we win? Well, from an economic standpoint, they just committed double buyback on, on heroes to be able to defend that, and we didn't, we, well, I guess we bought back on one hero. Our panda bought back, I'm not sure why, but he did, and then he ended up dying again, so that one was kind of bad. But from a... An overall standpoint of the game, they can't get anything after that team fight. Like, they just spent all that defending their base, they lose a tier 3, two heroes are forced to buy back, there's no Roche to claim. Even if there was, their team still can't really hit Roshan that well. So what we say is, okay, great. We have to deal with less buybacks. 
And now we can just go up top again. Even though we don't have the Aegis, they're not going to have buyback on the Storm. So if that guy dies, he can't come back. If the Disruptor dies, he can't come back. Like right now, the only person with buyback on the enemy team is Alina. So we go for the immediate push again. I'm putting myself in front. I'm trying to uh, trying to make things happen. Our panda gets picked off again, which is a little bit unfortunate, but I'm really strong. Like, I'm just sitting in their base. I have 5,000 HP. I eat a Doom. And I come back in to try to help my uh, my Storm player, but... Or, excuse me, my Sniper player, but he gets killed by the Storm. So, okay, why did we lose that fight? We lost that fight because our Panda died without casting any spells. So if the Panda doesn't get picked off, we probably just straight up end the game. Because the Storm was really, really low. So that one, I think I, I positioned and played it correctly. I put myself in the front... And I wanted to make it so that the enemy team cast spells on me, and they did. I ate a Doom. That's awesome. If I get Doomed, that means my Zeus can cast spells, my Brewmaster can split if he doesn't get picked. Like, all these things that happen in the fight happen basically because I am getting attacked. Now, whenever you're playing a 4 with a very large effective health pool, like Pudge, especially during the late game, the more stuff that hits you, the better it is. If it takes the enemy team 20 seconds to kill you, that's 20 seconds of time that your Zeus and Sniper are doing work. You know, even your tree can get, like, an overgrowth off or drop a meteor hammer or something like that. So utilizing your hero's strength, in this case, just having a lot of HP, is a really good way to benefit your team in the fight. So we respawn here. I think I actually got up to do something really quick. I was just AFK in the wall for, like, a minute. So our next item is going to be Blade Mill. Just furthering the I want people to hit me kind of mantra that we've adopted here. And again, some fours are going to be different. You're not always going to go like these types of items. But just try to think about what your hero's good at and what your hero wants to do in the fight. Besides landing a hook, what my hero wants to do is stand in the middle of the enemy team dealing damage with Rot. That's my primary purpose. So anything that I can buy that's going to benefit me being in close quarters is what I want. So I end up getting caught here. I pop the blade mill. The storm pretty much kills himself on it. He had like 10 HP. But that was a bad death. Uh, mainly because I didn't have anyone near me. And my tree was already dead. So I, I assumed that the enemy team didn't see me. And that I would be able to be safe just by sitting in the trees. But the storm did see me. So he goes in. Even though I almost got a kill on him, which, if that happens, it would have been super worthwhile for me to die. Then, it's not a big deal. But that's not what happened. The storm saw me, and I ended up getting picked because I wasn't really paying attention to the respawn timer on my tree. So for now, we're waiting. We're respawning. Our team is kind of getting into a fight up here, and uh, it doesn't end up working out. My player perspective is just me not looking at what's happening. Alright, so the Storm and the Disruptor buy back again. They end up losing a couple of heroes to our Sniper, so now we've got another opportunity. Our Sniper's hitting the high ground. We're posturing so that we can potentially get some hits in. I mean, at this point, we hit for like 260 damage and have an Assault Keras, so our right-click damage is still pretty nasty. We blink forward. Putting our body in the front. I tried to hook my sniper away from death, but it doesn't end up working that way. And hey, look at that. I got doomed again. Not only did I get doomed, but they still end up taking a tremendous amount of damage anyway, and I still live. So my bike comes back up. I blink back in. Get that his number on the storm, knowing that he doesn't have buyout anymore. And you know, at this point, we've mega them. It feels alright. 25 flesh heap stacks. Not an awful game. But we're going to pause really quick. We're going to talk about the scoreboard and stuff. Now, I had 13 deaths this game. 13 deaths is, for a 52-minute game, I'd say, it, you know, it's, it's not great. Like, I died more than I needed to. I had a death mid where I hooked a guy that I did not want to hook. Ended up killing my team. That's a bad death. I had a death where I bought back after hooking said hero into my team and killing them. And then died again for no reason. So that was a bad death. 
I had one top where I was like trying to get into a position to hook and didn't realize the enemy team saw me and they kill me. That was a bad death, right? When you're watching your replays, it's important to be able to tell the difference between when your death was good and when it was bad and also understanding why it was good or bad. So in this game, I would say anywhere from four to five of my deaths were just unnecessary and or bad. The other deaths were okay. Some of them were in the laning phase. Uh, some of them were during the mid game when I was committing to fights and knowing that I would probably be the one to die. But as long as you know that, if you're playing a four or five and you know that your death is, is valuable because it got something in return like a tower or you saved a core or whatever, it's a lot easier to, to keep your head on straight in a match and just be like, okay, that was a fine death. You know, I, we traded three for one. Or that was a fine death. We got a tower. We got Roche. A lot of people who play Dota just die and they just get mad. They just die and they go, oh man, I'm, I'm upset because I died. Your KDA means nothing. It actually means nothing. That's why the matchmaking algorithm pretty much only counts for wins and losses. Because it doesn't matter how many times you die in a game, if every single one of your deaths is a good death, you will still probably win the game. Now being able to judge when it's good or it's bad in the moment is going to take practice. But as long as you're you know, you're scrutinizing your own replays and just being like, okay, this was pretty bad, this was good, then you're going to improve. So I hope this video helps you guys. Obviously, this game's over. We've made them. We died 13 times. It's a lot of deaths, but hey, it's a 52-minute game. We're a pudge. We really want to be in the middle of the action. That's kind of how this hero works. And even though we won, there was a million things I could have done better this game. So no matter what level Dota play you are, whether you be Herald or Immortal, you can always watch your replays, and you can always try to learn from them. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video very much. Uh, if you could, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're trying to hit the, the 1,000 subscriber mark. It's still a relatively new channel. It's only been around for a couple of weeks. I don't pedal it that much, but we're going to try to get everything sorted out for the near future, and we'll get some maybe editing in the future as well so the videos seem a bit more professional. You guys can catch me on Twitch at Draskyl. It's D-R-A-S-K-Y-L. You can also follow me on Twitter, Draskyl Dota 2 T-W-O. Once again, thank you guys very much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.